So now we're going to take a peek and see the, a new tool or two inside TaxonWorks. And thinking about the fact that a lot of what we do, depending on how we look at data, often we're looking at rows and columns. And I've said for a long time that that's not always the easiest way to find issues in your data. So with that, where's our agency in this process? So we all spend time uh, at our different jobs, in our different roles, somewhere we're looking at data. And the first thing I'd like to know from you is kind of something more about where uh, you fit in this process. Where do you do this? And so there's a quick poll here coming up. 60% answered the poll, yay. All right, here we go. So let's have a look. What did we say? We have aggregator feedback. When you tidy data, what tools and services do you use? There are some people starting to use ChatGPT as well. Command line. Ah, Bob, that make you happy there? 21% of the respondents said they do use the command line. GIS tools. I wanted to make a point here, this, these two options, online resources using the web interface, mobile names and uh, Bionomia, et cetera, catalog of life, uh, the API access to those things. Do you knows your data well? This has to do with this sort of data fidelity. Who, who knows what your data ought to look like? Who knows what your data is all about in terms of the, the parameters that you set? Who knows the sort of metadata of your data? Um, and what happens, is that written down, where is it? So this, this speaks to data being able to go on and have a life uh, beyond its initial use. Um, it's the most challenging tidy data task. So then you have to click yeah, view details as Matt's pointing out here. And view details, aha, now we can see. Making data compatible with TaxonWorks. So we can show you more about how to do that. Codings, oh yeah. Cool, we're gonna have lots of times to look at those answers there, that's great. Thank you for sharing these insights. All right, so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and continue with the talk now that we all have a little bit more idea about each other's processes. So we all spend time doing this and we've noted just a few ways now in your feedback uh, in different ways in which it can be uh, daunting. And so what can we do about that? So have you ever noticed when you find an issue and you go looking, you, you find another one and another one? It seems like a rabbit holes to me oftentimes when I was first learning SQL and I would find an error and then I would go to fix it and uh, it would be like, what happened? 20 minutes later, I was somewhere else completely in the data. Um, and then, so it's, it's kind of like whack-a-mole. You, you whack on one and then no sooner you do that, something else pops up. Over the years, I've been inspired by various tools and processes uh, some of you will know OpenRefine, others will be familiar with Buoyant Tools or Carrot Squared for sort of visualizing the data as you go through it. Uh, if you know structured query language, you'll understand this select distinct values. What can you see about what's inside your data? One of you mentioned this in your comments when you talked about your uh, staff and your uh, people that you hire to do the work and you're like unsure exactly of what they're doing and you wanna be able to vet their data. So having this kind of skill um, helped me begin to understand what those skills could do to help me with that feeling of uncertainty. Uh, and, and as well as tools like regex, this regular expressions and using tools like ChatGPT. So you'll see some inspiration from these various things about to happen. So some of you are familiar already with this and maybe somebody can put this nice link in the chat. Um, without going into details here. The point is we have fields, we put data in them. In this case, this is the sex field. This is an old data file from, I believe this might be IDIG Biodata. It could be GBIF data as well. It's one of the two. 
and it's the sex field before the data is cleaned up and indexed. So there were like 19,000 records at the aggregator level where the data set went at has, you know, a two for sex. Well, nobody's going to search the sex field for the number two. It doesn't make any sense. Um, so these are the kind of things that aggregators face when they look at data. It's also the kind of things that the Paleo Data Working Group, as Erica, Talia, and Holly kind of pointed out, and one of you mentioned it in particular, is the notion of getting the group together at the paleo level, collection managers all across the planet, and essentially looking inside their databases and going, how can we, how can we work on this? So distinct values and how often they happen can help a lot. It can also help the aggregator see if things are getting better or worse as we do the work. So it's kind of another measure that's interesting to see. Inside taxon works, we have a new task called project vocabulary. In essence, we're looking inside each bucket. So for a given model, this is collecting event, we can look inside a given field. In this case, verbatim locality. And then the system shows us what's in verbatim locality and how many times. We can sort by term, we can sort by count. It's very fun, honestly. And right away, many of you are gonna notice this funny comma at the beginning. You're like, what's up with that? And looking at tools like uh, Carrot Squared and others, this notion of taking this data and also presenting it to you this way. This gives you an instantly different picture of sort of the scale and scope of the issues because now it's not a number in a column, it's a visual representation of the sort of scale and it's clickable. So you can click here and see these records. I'm gonna to go to Giant City State Park or I can click here. And now I get the rows and columns I was talking about. Okay, great. Now we're back to rows and columns, what to do? Well, we can click on linker and we're gonna to go to this task called field synchronize. And please somebody give me a two minute warning when I'm out of time. Now we have taken that same Giant City State Park and we can see it in a way that's gonna allow us to change it. And in this case, we're gonna go from this field to the same field. And we can do find and replace, uh, we have 97 records. So we can do you know, comma space, replace with nothing and voila, now I can apply that to all. Many of you that do work with regular expressions and more complicated ways of uh, moving data from one field to another, replacing data in a given field, uh, adding data to a given field, extracting data from a given field, will recognize that there are the power here of uh, regular expressions to help you and tools like ChatGPT. So how many of you here, if you are willing to share in the chat, um, I guess plus one if you've don't know anything about regex. That's completely new to you. you can put a plus one in the chat, if you're willing. Any plus ones popping up? Yes, I see some. All right, cool. Well, you're about to find out that voila, with the help of something like ChatGPT, you too can take the benefit of regular expressions. And the, one of the cool parts is here I wanted to say, find Charles A. Bridges not Charles A. Bridges or Richard Holland, and not Charles A. Bridges where the A is lowercase. And I asked ChatGPT to help me write that, put it in here and you can see it finds it and I can click apply or I could click apply all for all of these. That's a very quick tour of what this does. But the point is that you can then also take your data, this is a, a, a um, a verbatim field, the buffer determinations, a field we expect never to change. We just put in there what's on the label. And we're going to pass that information into the identified by field. So we went from finding an issue by looking inside the bucket and saying, what are the strings in there and how many times do they occur, right? To a task that actually lets us then address those issues in a visual way not rows and columns, where we'd be forced to download a CSV, try to figure out how to sort, try to do a replace, try to make sure we didn't overwrite the wrong columns or sort the wrong way, uh, et cetera, or add spaces, Bob and BSP or something dreadful. 
like that. So taking it up a level now, think about it. We are discovering issues, we're extending the data, we're empowering knowledge transfer, and we're doing trying to do it in a transparent way. So visualization with these tasks really helps you. All of these things involve the fact that we have long-term memory. How did What did we decide to do in the project? Did we use minimal data capture? Who knows that? How are they gonna learn your data? So what's that gonna look like in the future? And how do people that are new to your data sets even begin to understand what's in the pile? Because frankly, it's a lot easier to get to your know, to know your data this way than it is to get to know your data. Mm, where's that spreadsheet? But this way. Um, we need them all, they, they're great. It's just that we need tools to help us do this to address the kind of things that we're talking about. So with that, a couple of quick examples and I'll be done here. This is another one where we're in the collecting event again and we're looking at start date month. So this is some, you, some of you may have seen this on social media. If this is the start date month for our collecting events, what does it might tell you about what are, where are collections located? Anybody can guess where on the planet? I see somebody commented in the chat. So yeah, you can tell that this, our summer months, we must be in the Northern hemisphere. You can tell that, you know, the months, the winter months here in the Northern hemisphere are, are tiny, right? So see, seeing the data this way is very different from seeing the data this way. And here you notice open and field synchronized. So if you wanted to move to the next task to do operate on one of these, uh, you could. So you can imagine this is a way to see other data that needs parsing. If you chose, and, and some of you hinted at that, Tommy, I think you too. Uh, if you did a digitization project and you chose to do a uh, minimal data capture, sometimes that's called skeletal record. Um, you may have captured your determination information, who determined it and what did they say, uh, what name did they apply, is, is stuck in a sort of a verbatim field. So here we see collection object buffer determination. Two minutes. Thank you. And with that, we're like, all right, well, really, to make that data useful at the level of GBIF and IDIC bio, maybe perhaps even inside our own local system, we need to get the person's name into the determination, who did the determination field, and we need to get the what it is into the determination field. And again, this allows you to act on many records at once. So you could, um, again, take this uh, Tabanis Sakinai, and you could, for 668 records, then pass this determination, this person's name to the determination and pass this taxon name um, into the determination field with field synchronized. So I, I also have to say, I'm very proud of the minimal data capture and release, but anyway, that came to me when I was writing this. <laughs> we have to get that data out. We captured it minimally to make it faster, but we haven't released it yet. So, to reiterate, we all spend time doing this, whether we're at the aggregator level and we're trying to do something so the data makes sense going at the, out at the aggregator level to the people collecting it and everybody in between and downstream. We might be talking about missing data where we're trying to fill it manually and hopefully have better ways to do that like I was just showing. Um, we need help with noisy data. We need clustering algorithms, the kind of things that um, People have been adding at different levels at the aggregator uh, down to our CMSs so that we can figure out what needs to be done. Uh, and to be able to improve inconsistent data, this is where we need those tools that link out to other tools and services, um, global names, catalog of life, Plazi, uh, the data validation tool that you brought up, Kat. Uh, so with that, I wanna say thank you to all of you who've been listening to me for a long time, as I've described the power in this sort of data visualization process in a local CMS. I can tell you there were people who told me way back in 2012 that data visualization was only for researchers, that collection managers didn't need it. And I was the only one in the room saying that that wasn't true. 
So I'm happy to see that we're moving away from thinking that visualization is only uh, for researchers. Thank you to the team uh, for, for helping make this a reality. Oops. And for you for paying this potential forward.